How big is reverse immigration and why is it happening? So the reason essentially is money. Either they are not making enough money or they are not able to save enough money. We are short of 4.4 million homes in the next five years. It was very difficult for me to find a family doctor in Kitchener when we moved from Etobicoke. You actually don't have to buy a primary house if you are retiring in India or move to US or Dubai after citizenship where you can make a lot more and that will help you increase the rate of investments a lot faster. More than 20,000 Canadians are leaving Canada every single quarter. So in today's video, we are going to dissect reverse immigration. So let's get started. So in today's presentation, I'll be talking about the numbers. How big is reverse immigration and why is it happening? I'll be also be talking about the Canadian economy and its reliance on immigrants. And then finally, I'll be talking about how to rewire the Canadian dream. A lot of people are thinking that the Canadian dream is over, which might be true for the majority of people who are leaving. But still, I just want to give some perspective, some you know long term perspective, which was actually part of my $5 million workshop as well. And then I'll be talking about how to rewire the Canadian dream. A lot of people are saying that Canadian dream is over. and I don't fully agree to that because we are missing a long term perspective and I'll talk about that in today's video. So do watch the video till the end. Before I proceed with the presentation, if you have ever gained anything out of my videos, it will be really great if you can hit the subscribe button. There are 60% of people who are watching the video who are not actually subscribed. It will help my channel to grow and reach more people. So now let's talk about the numbers. Now I'm sure you've all heard about this, that the Canada population has increased by over 1 million people in 2022. And this number is mostly made of immigrants. 96 percent of this 1 million number is made of immigrants. So it's fair to say that immigrants made the majority of this increase. That led Canada's population to grow to almost 40 million, which is a 2.7 percent increase versus last year. This is 2022. 2023 numbers are not released yet. So this is 2022 versus 2021. I'm sure we have crossed 40 million in 2023. But just to put thing this 2.7 percent in perspective, India's population grew by 0.7 percent at the same time. US population grew by 0.4 percent. China's population was stagnant. And and Dubai, which is a hotspot for a lot of people who are moving, especially a lot of Canadians are moving for tax purposes, is also 1.5%. There are only 15 countries which are above Canada in terms of growth rate. And all those countries are extremely small and they come nowhere to the size of population that Canada has. That's the amount of immigration that happens in Canada. And it's very clear that we are not stopping. Canada is looking to stabilize the immigration levels because some years have been 300,000, some years have been 200,000, some years has been a million. So they are trying to stabilize the number at about 500,000 immigrants per year by 2026. And this ties in very well with the IRCC numbers that they released last year on how immigration would look like in the next three years. So let's assume on average, the number of people that will come to Canada is about 500,000. However, there are about 80 to 100,000 immigrants who are leaving Canada every single year. If you look at this chart, this is a chart from 2018 to 2023. On average, now there have been some anomalies. For example, this was just after COVID. So a lot of people who wanted to leave before COVID, they actually left, you know, um, after COVID, which is in the Q3 and Q4 of 2022. But if you look at these numbers, on average, uh, across the last three or four years, the number has been about 21,000. However, there are about 80,000 to 100,000 immigrants that are leaving Canada every single year. This chart right here actually shows the amount of the number of immigrants that are leaving Canada every quarter. And on average from 2018 to 2023, the number has been about 21,647, which is highlighted here. There have been some high months, there have been some low months, but we, it's safe to assume that there are about 80,000 to 100,000 people who are leaving Canada every single year. Now, if you think about about this 500,000 people are coming 100,000 people are leaving that's an attrition about 20% but if you put this number into perspective it's just 0.25% of the population now the population of Canada grew by over 2% so 0.25 reduction in population is not going to hurt Canada in the short run. I'm not saying reverse immigration or immigration is good or bad. I'm just stating the facts here and we'll dissect these facts in the later part of the presentation. The second point is there are 2.5 million people who left India in 2022. That's 0.2% of the population. So every year India is losing about 0.2% of the population to immigration. So I agree that reverse immigration is happening in Canada. But if you compare it to other countries, there are countries where people are actually leaving for different reasons. The third important point is we need to understand who is leaving and why. So as per a recent study in Canada, most of the people who are leaving Canada are either leaving because they did not get a job in their prescribed field or they are not earning enough compared to what they were earning back home, whether it's in India or wherever they came from, or 
it's a high cost of living. Fact is that if you look at any economy, the economy is run by when people spend money. If people are not making enough money, they are not paying enough tax and therefore they are not spending, these 80,000 people who are moving away from Canada will contribute very little to the tax collection. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing for Canada. Obviously, in the long run, it's a bad thing for Canada, especially for people like us who uproot their entire life back home to come to Canada. And then because of not enough jobs or because of high cost of living, you will have to go back and those years will not come back. So I'm not discounting the fact that they have not been able to live up to the expectations that they set for the immigrants but at the same time people who are in the lower income bracket when they leave Canada the amount of tax deficit that they create for Canada is minimal which is why despite the numbers being so high it's not been talked about enough by the government or the media however there is no denying the fact that Canada needs consistent immigration Canada is a land of immigration and it will always remain like that. And the reason is that the number of taxpayers per retiree is reducing. So this is a chart where in 1980, there were six taxpayers for every retired person. That number reduced to four taxpayers for every retired person in 2015. And that's when they accelerated their immigration because by 2030, the number of taxpayers to retiree ratio will be three. And that's a massive problem for Canada because the tax collection that happens from the taxpayers goes towards social security of people who are retired. So if there are not enough taxpayers, they'll not be able to support the retired population. What's worse is the organic population of Canada is actually declining and getting older. Right now, 19% of population is age 65 plus, which means they are retired. But this number is estimated to increase to about 25% by 2030 when more than 5 million Canadians will retire. Now, let's see how these numbers translate into dollars. Back in 1988, they were spending $45 billion on senior social security budget. That increased to about $69 billion in 2022, which is right now. And by 2029, this will increase by almost 50% to over $100 billion. So in about 35 years, the budget increased from 45 to 69, which is about a 50% increase. But this number will again increase by another 50% in just seven years because the amount of population which is getting older, the amount of population who will get retired. And with the increased inflation, Canada cannot afford to have less taxpayers. And that's the reason why they have accelerated the number of immigrants that are coming to Canada. And the number now sits at about five. 100,000. And honestly, the aging population of Canada is not a new problem. Here's a publication from the government of Canada. This is a report prepared by Health Canada on Canada's aging population. And this is dated 2002. So this is 2002. This is a pretty old report. And if you look at this report, and I'll you know link that in the description, you can read it uh, at your time. But they knew from 1921 all the way to 2041, they had estimated that the number of old people or the aging population or the retired population will increase. So back in 2002, they estimated that by 2021, we'll have about 18% of population which is retired. We are sitting at about 19%. So they were pretty accurate. However, they did underestimate the amount of people that will retire in the next 20 years. So by 2041, what they are saying is that we'll still be under 25%. But the new estimates say, which are more recent estimates say that by 2030, we'll actually actually hit the number of 25%, which means that 25% of population will be retired, an increase of an entire 6% from where we are today. In fact, if you look at the official Canadian website, which is Canada.ca, and you go into Immigration Matters, which is a section on the website. So Canada is actually justifying why they are calling so many immigrants. And it's clearly written that they want to support their aging population. And if you look at this, you know, the, there are things like, you know, income tax being paid by working Canadians. Uh, they want, you know, the uh, immigrants to be actually paying for the retirees, which which makes sense, right? which is what we discussed right now. They talk about meeting the labor demands as well. They talk about filling temporary labor jobs, you know, like people working in Tim Hortons, people working as laborers, people are working in skill trades. So all that, you know, needs to happen. Then sustaining Canada's education through inter international students, it's very, very clear, right? So there are $21 billion that international students get uh, and that actually funds tuition fee for Canadians. And that's something which is very clearly laid out on this particular link. Uh, and then obviously, you know, it's boosting trade. Obviously, there'll be more people, the service economy that we will talk about in the subsequent slides. And this is not some third party website or a media company. This is actually Canada.ca, which is the official website of IRCC, which is also the reason why immigration is not new to Canada. If you look at the immigration charts and the number of people who actually enter Canada, it's been pretty flat. And this increase to 500,000 immigrants per year is a direct consequence of their previous estimates being wrong. And the rate of increase of aging population and the retirees is much higher than what they anticipated. 
Okay. However, we have a massive problem and that's the reason why a lot of Canadians are leaving Canada. That's the reason why we have reverse immigration and that's because 75% of jobs in Canada are in the service industry. Now, that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing because in a service-based industry, what you service is people. If there are more people, there have to be more banks and therefore there will be more jobs and it becomes like a self-sustaining circle where you have more people, you have more services and therefore you have more jobs and therefore you need more people and it just becomes this cycle. That's what I feel that Canada was relying on. However, if you look at the service industry, that's healthcare, education, restaurants, software developers, banking, financial services, trades like cleaning, repair, landscaping. But the problem is they miss in infrastructure because you need to build infrastructure. So if you talk about healthcare, there are not enough hospitals, there are not enough beds. If you talk about education, teachers are not paid enough. If you talk about restaurants, the rents are so high because of the densification because so many people live in Toronto and therefore the real estate is limited in Toronto. Therefore, the rents to open these restaurants is very, very high. If you talk about software developers, there's not enough innovation because the freedom, if you look at the top 10 companies in Canada, none of the companies are IT companies. But if you look at the top 10 companies in the US, eight of those 10 companies are IT companies. So there's lack of innovation, there's lack of IT. Yes, in a high market, there are a lot of IT jobs, but there is still a lot of brain drain that's happening from Canada towards US, where most of the high paying IT jobs are. If you talk about banking and financial services, I don't know about you, but when I went to my bank to ask for a locker, there were not enough lockers. And that's also part of infrastructure. Then you talk about trades like cleaning, repair, landscaping. Yes, these are really lucrative trades. However, they are not enough homes. They're not enough homeowners who can actually take these services. The the problem is that this self-sustaining cycle cannot run if we do not build infrastructure and that's where Canada fell short. Now we all know about the housing crisis. As per CMHC, there are about 4.4 million homes. We are short of 4.4 million homes in the next five years. That's massive. With about 500,000 people coming every year, they'll require about 200,000 more homes. These are new homes which will be required every single year. Otherwise, the real estate market will keep going up because the demand and supply gap is massive. One in four Ontarians do not have a family doctor. I don't know about you, but it was very difficult for me to find a family doctor in Kitchener when we moved from Etobicoke. As per the recent report by Health Canada, Ontario needs 60,000 more staff and 8,000 more beds to address hospital crisis. There are people who are dying in the hospitals because there are not enough doctors and not enough beds. And that's not acceptable. Now, let's talk about cost of living and people moving to Alberta. Now, a lot of people in Ontario and BC, because the cost of living was increasing, uh, the housing prices were very high. They flocked towards Alberta. And the population growth in Alberta has been the highest since 1914. 14, 1, 4. And that's amazing. And while that sounds amazing, but Calgary is facing a massive funding gap because they are not able to build infrastructure for these people fast enough. So even if Canada is a service-based economy, and I understand that more population means more services, more services mean more people, and it's a self-sustaining cycle, but infrastructure is so important and you need time to build infrastructure. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are moving away from Canada and rightly so. So is the Canadian dream over? That's a very, very personal question, but I think that we need a little bit of rewiring. As immigrants, especially new immigrants, if you are thinking of coming to Canada, you are watching this video, you need to think of Canada a little bit differently. And the one question that we all need to answer is where do you want to retire? If the answer is that I want to retire in Canada, that will be a very long and difficult road. That's where you'll have to build assets. That's where you'll have to, you know, have a, a second job. That's where you'll have to build side hustles. That's where you'll have to build business like I'm building. And that's a very long and a difficult road. However, if your answer is that I want to retire in India or your home country or in a developing country, Canada is actually a shortcut. And let me explain you with numbers what I mean by that. Now, let's say you want to retire in India. The amount of money that you require to retire in India, let's say you are 35 right now, I'm 35 right now. In 30 years, 65, I want to retire in India. What I have to do is really simple. You need to have liquid assets, which is investing $1,000 a month. Let's say me and Simran, we are a couple. We invest $500 per person, which is $1,000 per month into our TFSA, which is our tax-free savings account. If you don't know what this is, I would highly recommend that you watch the video, which I link in the description below. That gives me a 6% return and I do $1,000 in TFSA in let's say an S&P 500 and it grows by 6% every single year. On average, 30 years, the year-on-year -year growth is 6% and that will leave me with about $1 million of tax-free money. Again, tax-free savings account is tax paid dollars going into the TFSA. You invest that money to S&P 500 and all the gains that you get are tax free. So this money, $1 million that will compound over 30 years because you're putting $1,000 every single month. 
that will compound to about a million dollars. So apart from investing $1,000 per month into your TFSA, the second thing that you do is let's say you buy a primary house for let's say $700,000 and you pay it down to zero in 30 years. You don't switch, you don't do anything. You just pay the same house to zero or you upgrade, but you pay it down to zero in 30 years. What that would do is at a 4% year on year increase, I'm just taking a 4% year on year increase. In Canada, the average increase for the past 25 years has been 6.2%, but I'm taking a 4% increase and this will compound to about $2.3 million. Again, it's a primary house, therefore you do not have to pay any tax on this. You just have the net proceeds from sale, which is 5% cost, realtor fee, a lawyer fee and all that. That will amount to about 2.2 million. So your net proceeds, because you don't have a mortgage on this, will be about $2.2 million. This money, $1 million plus $2 million, $3 million will be tax-free. Now, this particular retirement plan will not work if you want to retire in Canada because you'll always need a roof above you and therefore you'll never sell your primary house and therefore you're only left with $1 million, which is nearly not enough for retirement in Canada, especially 30 years from now when the worth of $1 million will be a lot lower. However, if you take this entire amount, $2.2 million plus $1 million, amount $3 million, and if I assume the same currency that we have today, and again, this money will be tax-free, that's 20 crore that you can take to India and retire really well, even in 30 years adjusted for inflation. With the 4% rule of retirement, if you don't know what 4% rule is, that basically means that if I draw 4% from my corpus of money, let's say in this case, it's 20 crore, and I grow this money by more than 4% every single year, let's say you invest it into bonds or, you know, like a high interest savings account or, you know, stock market, which gives you like a 6 to 8% return, then you are drawing 4%, your money is growing by more than 4%. That means that you are not touching your 20 crore rupees and you are still being able to draw 4%, which is 80 lakh, which is 6.5 lakh per month. Even adjusted for inflation in 30 years, 6.5 lakh per month will be good amount of money, even if you use a little bit to buy a house for yourself to live in. So if you are to retire in India, this is a perfectly nice plan. And if you are already doing this, you do not have to panic. Now, if you want to retire early, you can aggressively pay down your payments. Let's say you have an increase in salary. You actually do $500 per month of mortgage payments, which are additional to the mortgage payment that you're already doing. And that way you can pay down the mortgage seven years early. If you do $1,000 per month, you can pay down the mortgage 11 years early and so on and so forth. You can just put the additional money that you are getting every single month in the increment or a side sale that you have. You can aggressively pay down your mortgage and retire a little bit early. Now, some of you might be thinking that Navjot is a mortgage agent and therefore he wants us to buy a primary house. So for just those people, I have a second slide for you. And let's assume that you now do not want to buy a primary house. You actually don't have to buy a primary house if you are retiring in India. All you need to do to achieve the same 20 crore is to up your investing into your TFSA or wherever you invest RRSP to about $3,000. And that way you will compound your money, let's say at 6% again, to about $3 million. And this will be partially tax-free because TFSA money will be tax-free when you take it out. But if you put it into RRSP and other you know investment vehicles or in a normal, you know, like a investing account, you will be taxed on the capital gain. So it will not be entirely tax-free, but that's okay. You'll be in the range of about 20 crore again. And then if your salary is increased, you can actually increase that $3,000 and, and then you can retire in India a lot faster than 30 years. Now, there's another thing that you can do to increase your savings rate and your investment rate and your retirement into India a little bit faster. And that is to change your job and move into a contract role or move to US or Dubai after citizenship where you can make a lot more and that will help you increase the rate of investments a lot faster and you'll be able to land yourself with 15 to 20 crore rupees a lot faster. So what I mean by this is that I understand that reverse immigration is stressful. I understand that the cost of living is very high right now, but you do not always have to go back. You just need to rewire yourself and see what your finances are. And still, if you feel that it makes sense to go back, then by all means you should. But in order to retire well, especially if you're not doing it in Canada or a developed country, you do not have to buy investment properties. You do not have to start a side hustle or do multiple jobs. You do not have to build a multi-million dollar business. You do not have to take much risk at all. You can just invest all the money to S&P 500. Obviously, if you buy a house for yourself, it just diversifies your investment and makes it tax-free. And that's the reason why, you know, I like the first plan better than the second one where you just do the TFSA or do the uh, stock market. It's just less diversified but you do not have to take a lot of this risk and you do not have to do a lot of these things just because someone else is doing it or it sounds cool. Now, I understand that a lot of people are leaving Canada and we hear that a lot on social media right now. But if this presentation helped you even the slightest bit, I would highly recommend that you share this with your friends. 
and know that you do not have to complicate your journey in Canada and there is a much better way to retire. You can actually use your Indian origin to get ahead on your retirement. That's all I have for today. Milte hain agli video mein. Tab tak ke liye. Bye bye.